Stationary power plants burn oil, but in that application, it's easily substituted by coal or nuclear. Um, home heating uh, is an important uh, use of oil. Uh, many people, homeowners will be in serious trouble if the price of oil skyrockets, as it has. Um, but by far the most important use of oil is in transportation. Cars, trucks, planes, ships, and trains all use oil, and it's difficult to imagine them running without it. This gives uh, some idea of the global use of, uh, of uh, energy of various forms. It's for the year 1998, but it hasn't changed all that much since then. About 10 uh, terawatts is the, the scale on the left-hand side, terawatts. Um, about 10 terawatts of fossil fuels, half of it being oil, uh, and then various other incidental uh, sources of fuel, of, of, uh, of energy. Uh, for a total of 13 terawatts worldwide, of which we in the U.S. use 3.3 terawatts. Uh, we use a quarter of the world's energy, although we have only 5% of the world's uh, population. We are profligate users of energy. Uh, 99 quads, quads are quadru quadrillion uh, British thermal units. That's the last time you'll hear that unit used in this talk. So. Uh, if we're running out of, of, uh, of oil, what uh, can substitute for it? Well, um, the economists say that there's no problem. When the oil runs out, uh, something else will come along driven by price. Um, so let's look and see what else there is. First of all, oil refers not only to the light crude oil that, that's been uh, used up to now, but it refers also to heavy oil um, and to uh, oil sands and tar sands. Uh, heavy oil is basically what's left behind when the light crude has been pumped out of the field. It's always possible to recover more of it. Remember, they, they said in that article that we've only used about a third of the oil that's been discovered. Um, that's what they were referring to. The heavy oil is difficult to get out. It can be gotten out with increased technology, but it becomes more and more expensive. The more you pump, the heavier it gets. Um, the, oil, the tar sands of Alberta have been renamed oil sands to attract investment. It takes two tons of ore, strip mined ore, from Alberta sands, tar sands or oil sands, to make one barrel of, of a, a liquid that's not rich enough to distill into gasoline. So hydrogen has to be added, and some of the world's largest plants for extracting hydrogen from natural gas have been built in Alberta. That's characteristic of everything going down the scale. It becomes more expensive, uh, more uh, environmentally harmful, uh, more dangerous uh, to extract. Uh, natural gas is a good substitute for oil. It can be turned into a liquid fuel by chemical means, or it can be used in compressed form. Uh, but uh, Hubbard's peak for natural gas is only about 10 years behind Hubbard's peak for oil, so it's a temporary solution at best. Shale oil. Uh, shale oil is unborn oil, that is to say, uh, oil is born when organic matter sinks below the ocean into the interior of the earth. The interior of the earth is heated by natural radioactivity, uh, and if it sinks just to the right depth, it gets turned into oil. If it, doesn't, if it sinks too far, it gets turned into to natural gas and po possibly escapes or possibly stays behind. Uh, if it doesn't sink far enough, it never gets turned into oil. That's what shale oil is. It's oil that was never born. Shale oil uh, consists of these organic conclusions in, uh, in matter. There is enough shale oil uh, in the Four Corners region of the United States to substitute for all the oil in the world, but uh, it has to be heated in a retort, uh, and that's extreme after being strip mined. And that's extremely damaging environmentally. And uh, people who have looked into it carefully, who have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in it, have concluded that it will never be energy positive. It will only, always be energy negative. That is to say, it will always take more energy to get it out than it will produce, and have given up on it. So shale oil is, has a questionable future. Uh, methane hydrate is formed when methane comes into contact with hydrogen uh, in uh, under great pressure and uh, low temperature close to the freezing point of water. We know it exists in the polar regions and various other reg uh, regions. Nobody knows how much of it there is or how it could be mined or how it could be uh, extracted. We only know that it exists. And then finally, there is coal. 
Incidentally, th this curve shows uh, the greenhouse gases uh, that result from various different forms of uh, fuel, uh, with conventional oil being normalized to one. Uh, all of the other uh, sources of oil uh, produce more greenhouse gases, as you can see. So they, they, they are all uh, bad. Coal, um, there are, we are told that there are 100 or maybe thousands of years uh, uh, worth at the present rate of extraction but the, the present rate of extraction is the biggest lie of all. Um, the fact that, that estimates range from hundreds to thousands of years tell you that nobody has any idea of how much there actually is. They're, they're just guessing. The, the largest deposits of it are found in the United States, but there are large deposits in Russia and China as well. And it can be liquefied and turned into a, a substitute for oil. Uh, the, the Germans did that during World War II. They had coal, but no oil. Uh, and needed oil for their war machine. But it's a dirty fuel. It comes combined with mercury, arsenic, sulfur, and various other things that are difficult to get rid of. Uh, it's the worst possible uh, fuel from the point of view of the greenhouse effect because it's all carbon, uh, not partly hydrogen as the other fuels are. You have to increase the rate at which it's mined by a factor of five to replace the oil. We, we saw in an earlier graph that oil is about half the uh, fossil fuels used, twice as much as coal. To replace the missing oil, you'd have to drill, uh, drill coal much faster. But the conversion process is inefficient, as these processes always are. And so you have to drill faster still. So you'd have to increase the rate of extra extraction by at least a factor of five just to replace the amount of, uh, of oil we have now. That's mining coal on an absolutely unimaginable scale. But even then, it doesn't take into account the increasing population of the world the, higher, the, the, the fact that the poorer parts of the world want a higher standard of living, that is to say they want to be more like us and burn more energy, and so uh, that requires even more coal. And finally, there's the Hubbard's Peak effect, which is just as valid for coal as it is for oil. And all of these things considered, I think, that we will start to run out of coal if we turn blindly to, to, to coal, damn the consequences, and turn to coal for, uh, for fuel, uh, that we will start to run out of coal by the end of this century. So what does the future hold? Well, <clears throat> there'll be an oil crisis very soon. I don't know whether we, we, we're already in the oil crisis. There's evidence, of course, that we are, the, the skyrocketing price of oil. But it may not come for another 10 or 20 years. As I said, 20 years is nothing on the scale of human history. Even if we turn to coal to substitute for the oil, the all fossil fuels, coal included, will start to run out by the end of this century. And doing that would have unknown consequences for the climate of the planet. But if the climate survives and we survive, uh, we will then have the choice of, of turning to the only two possible alternatives, solar and nuclear. That raises a profound dilemma, all kinds of social and political dilemmas that Vernon Ellis, Ellis and others have talked about. Uh, but it also uh, has a technical aspect that I can speak about. One thing that can be done about this is conservation. Uh, Amory Levins has written an article uh, about the various forms of conservation that could be applied. He speaks of ultra strong uh, light, strong materials for making cars. Uh, we could all drive hybrids. I drive a hybrid. I don't see why everybody doesn't. Uh, we can have more efficient buildings and factories. We can get fuel from switchgrass and poplar. I've added sugarcane because that's the one crop that's actually used for fuel uh, in Brazil. Uh, where half the fuel comes from sugarcane. Uh, in the United States, where, where attempts are made to get fuel from corn, it simply has raised the price of corn uh, uh, and created other problems. You can't use all your arable land to grow fuel instead of food uh, because people will go hungry. You can use electricity more efficiently. You can have fee baits, that is to say you charge gas guzzling cars fees and re rebate them to the fuel efficient cars. That's the kind of uh, manipulation that our uh, politicians are loath to do and so on.